Left-Wing Communism, an Infantile Disorder, by V.I. Lenin. Chapter 4, The Struggle Against Which Enemies Within the Working Class Movement Helped Bolshevism Develop, Gain Strength, and Become Steeled. First and foremost, the struggle against opportunism, which in 1914 definitely developed into social chauvinism and definitely sided with the bourgeoisie against the proletariat. Naturally, this was Bolshevism's principal enemy within the working class movement. It still remains the principal enemy on an international scale. The Bolsheviks have been devoting the greatest attention to this enemy. This aspect of Bolshevik activities is now fairly well known abroad too. It was, however, different from Bolshevism's other enemy within the working class movement. Little is known in other countries of the fact that Bolshevism took shape, developed, and became steeled in the long years of struggle against petty bourgeois revolutionism, which smacks of anarchism, or borrows something from the latter and, in all essential matters, does not measure up to the conditions and requirements of a consistently proletarian class struggle. Marxist theory has established, and the experience of all European revolutions and revolutionary movements has fully confirmed, that the petty proprietor, the small master, who, under capitalism, always suffers oppression and very frequently a most acute and rapid deterioration in his conditions of life, and even ruin, easily goes to revolutionary extremes, but is incapable of perseverance, organization, discipline, and steadfastness. A petty bourgeois driven to frenzy by the horrors of capitalism is a social phenomenon which, like anarchism, is characteristic of all capitalist countries. The instability of such revolutionism, its barrenness, and its tendency to turn rapidly into submission, apathy, phantasms, and even a frenzied infatuation with one bourgeois fad or another. All this is common knowledge. However, a theoretical or abstract recognition of these truths does not at all rid revolutionary parties of old errors which always crop up at unexpected occasions in somewhat new forms in a hitherto unfamiliar garb or surroundings in an unusual, a more or less unusual, situation. Anarchism was not infrequently a kind of penalty for the opportunist sins of the working class movement. The two monstrosities complemented each other, and if in Russia, despite the more petty bourgeois composition of her population as compared with the other European countries, anarchism's influence was negligible during the two revolutions and the preparations for them. This should no doubt stand partly to the credit of Bolshevism, which has always waged a most ruthless and uncompromising struggle against opportunism. I say partly since of still greater importance in weakening anarchism's influence in Russia was the circumstance that in the past it was able to develop inordinately and to reveal its absolute erroneousness, its unfitness to serve the revolutionary class as a guiding theory. When it came into being in 1903, Bolshevism took over the tradition of a ruthless struggle against petty bourgeois semi-anarchist revolutionism, a tradition which had always existed in revolutionary social democracy and had become particularly strong in our country during the years 1900 to 1903, when the foundations for a mass party of the revolutionary proletariat was being laid in Russia. Bolshevism took over and carried on the struggle against a party which, more than any other, expressed the tendencies of petty bourgeois revolutionism, namely the Socialist Revolutionary Party, and waged that struggle on three main issues. 
First, that party, which rejected Marxism, stubbornly refused to understand the need for a strictly objective appraisal of the class forces and their alignment before taking any political action. Secondly, this party considered itself particularly revolutionary, or left, because of its recognition of individual terrorism, assassination, something that we Marxists emphatically rejected. It was, of course, only on grounds of expediency that we rejected individual terrorism, whereas people who were capable of condemning, on principle, the terror of the Great French Revolution, or, in general, the terror employed by a victorious revolutionary party, which is besieged by the bourgeoisie of the whole world, were ridiculed and laughed to scorn by Plekhanov in 1900 and 1903, when he was a Marxist and a revolutionary. Third, the socialist revolutionaries thought it very left to sneer at the comparatively insignificant opportunist sins of the German Social Democratic Party, while they themselves imitated the extreme opportunist of that party. For example, on the agrarian question, or on the question of the dictatorship of the proletariat. History, incidentally, has now confirmed on a vast and worldwide scale the opinion we have always advocated, namely, that German revolutionary social democracy came closest to being the party the revolutionary proletariat needs in order to achieve victory. Today, in 1920, after all the ignominious failures and crises of the war period in the early post-war years, it can be plainly seen that, of all the Western parties, the German revolutionary social democrats produced the finest leaders and recovered and gained new strength more rapidly than the others did. This may be seen in the instances both of the Spartacists and the left, proletarian wing of the independent Social Democratic Party of Germany, which is waging an incessant struggle against the opportunism and spinelessness of the Kautskys, Pilfordings, Ledebors, and Crispians. If we now cast a glance to take in a complete historical period, namely from the Paris Commune to the first socialist Soviet Republic, we shall find that Marxism's attitude to anarchism in general stands out most definitely and unmistakably. In the final analysis, Marxism proved to be correct, and although the anarchists rightly pointed to the opportunist views on the state prevalent among most of the socialist parties, it must be said, first, that this opportunism was connected with the distortion and even deliberate suppression of Marx's view on the state. Second, that the rectification of these opportunist views and the recognition of Soviet power and its superiority to bourgeois parliamentary democracy proceeded most rapidly and extensively among those trends in the socialist parties of Europe and America that were most Marxist. The struggle that Bolshevism waged against left deviations within its own party assumed particularly large proportions on two occasions. In 1908, on the question of whether or not to participate in a most reactionary parliament and in the legal workers' societies, which were being restricted by most reactionary laws, and again in 1918, on the question of whether one compromise or another was permissible. In 1908, the left Bolsheviks were expelled from our party for stubbornly refusing to understand the necessity of participating in a most reactionary parliament. The lefts, among whom there were many splendid revolutionaries who subsequently were commendable members of the Communist Party, based themselves particularly on the successful experience of the 1905 boycott. When, in August 1905, the Tsar proclaimed the convocation of a consultative parliament, the Bolsheviks called for its boycott, 
in the teeth of all the opposition parties and the Mensheviks and the parliament, was in fact swept away by the revolution of October 1905. The boycott proved correct at the time, not because non-participation in reactionary parliaments is correct in general, but because we accurately appraised the objective situation, which was leading to the rapid development of the mass strikes, first into a political strike, then into a revolutionary strike, and finally into an uprising. Moreover, the struggle centered at that time on the question of whether the convocation of the first representative assembly should be left to the Tsar, or an attempt should be made to wrest its convocation from the old regime. When there was not, and could not be, any certainty that the objective situation was of a similar kind, and when there was no certainty of a similar trend and the same rate of development, the boycott was no longer correct. The Bolsheviks' boycott of Parliament in 1905 enriched the revolutionary proletariat with highly valuable political experience and showed that, when legal and illegal parliamentary and non-parliamentary forms of struggle are combined, it is sometimes useful and even essential to reject parliamentary forms. It would, however, be highly erroneous to apply this experience blindly, imitatively, and uncritically to other conditions and other situations. The Bolsheviks' boycott of the Duma in 1906 was a mistake, although a minor and easily remediable one. The boycott of the Duma in 1907, 1908, and subsequent years was a most serious error and difficult to remedy because, on the one hand, a very rapid rise of the revolutionary tide and its conversion into an uprising was not to be expected, and, on the other hand, the entire historical situation attendant upon the renovation of the bourgeois monarchy called for legal and illegal activities being combined. Today, when we look back at this fully completed historical period, whose connection with subsequent periods has now become quite clear, it becomes most obvious that in 1908 to 1914, the Bolsheviks could not have preserved the core of the Revolutionary Party of the Proletariat had they not upheld, in a most strenuous struggle, the viewpoint that it was obligatory to combine legal and illegal forms of struggle, and that it was obligatory to participate even in a most reactionary parliament and in a number of other institutions hemmed in by reactionary laws. In 1918, things did not reach a split. At that time, the left communists formed only a separate group or faction within our party, and that not for long. In the same year, 1918, the most prominent representatives of left communism, for example, comrades Radek and Bukharin, openly acknowledged their error. It had seemed to them that the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk was a compromise with the imperialists, which was inexcusable on principle and harmful to the party of the revolutionary proletariat. It was indeed a compromise with the imperialists, but it was a compromise which, under the circumstances, had to be made. Today, when I hear our tactics in signing the Brest-Litovsk Treaty being attacked by the socialist revolutionaries, for instance, or when I hear Comrade Lansbury saying in a conversation with me, our British trade union leaders say that if it was permissible for the Bolsheviks to compromise, it is permissible for them to compromise too. I usually reply by first of all giving a simple and popular example. Imagine that your car is held up by armed bandits. You hand them over your money, passport, revolver, and car. In return, you are rid of the pleasant company of the bandits. That is unquestionably a compromise. 
It would, however, be difficult to find a sane man who would declare such a compromise to be inadmissible on principle, or who would call the compromiser an accomplice of the bandits. Our compromise with the bandits of German imperialism was just that kind of compromise. But when, in 1914 to 1918, and then in 1918 to 1920, the Mensheviks and socialist revolutionaries in Russia, the Scheidemannites in Germany, Otto Bauer and Friedrich Adler in Austria, the Renaudels and Longuets and Company in France, the Fabians, the Independents, and the Laborites in Britain entered into compromises with the bandits of their own bourgeoisie, and sometimes of the allied bourgeoisie, and against the revolutionary proletariat of their own countries. All these gentlemen were actually acting as accomplices in banditry. The conclusion is clear. To reject compromises on principle, to reject the permissibility of compromises in general, no matter of what kind, is childishness, which it is difficult even to consider seriously. A political leader who desires to be useful to the revolutionary proletariat must be able to distinguish concrete cases of compromises that are inexcusable and are an expression of opportunism and treachery. He must direct all the force of criticism, the full intensity of merciless exposure and relentless war against these concrete compromises and not allow the past masters of practical socialism and the parliamentary Jesuits to dodge and wriggle out of responsibility by means of disquisitions on compromises in general. It is in this way that the leaders of the British trade unions, as well as of the Fabian Society and the Independent Labour Party, dodge responsibility for the treachery they have perpetrated, for having made a compromise that is really tantamount to the worst kind of opportunism, treachery, and betrayal. There are different kinds of compromises one must be able to analyze the situation and the concrete conditions of each compromise, or of each variety of compromise. One must learn to distinguish between a man who has given up his money and firearms to bandits so as to lessen the evil they can do and to facilitate their capture and execution, and a man who gives his money and firearms to bandits so as to share in the loot. In politics, this is by no means always as elementary as it is in this childishly simple example. However, anyone who is out to think up for the workers some kind of recipe that will provide them with cut and dried solutions or all contingencies or promises that the policy of the revolutionary proletariat will never come up against difficult or complex situations is simply a charlatan. To leave no room for misinterpretation, I shall attempt to outline, if only very briefly, several fundamental rules for the analysis of concrete compromises. The party which entered into a compromise with the German imperialists by signing the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk had been evolving its internationalism in practice ever since the end of 1914. It was not afraid to call for the defeat of the Tsarist monarchy and to condemn defense of country in a war between two imperialist robbers. The parliamentary representatives of this party preferred exile in Serbia to taking a road leading to ministerial portfolios in a bourgeois government. The revolution that overthrew Tsarism and established a democratic republic put this party to a new and tremendous test. It did not enter into any agreements with its own imperialists, but prepared and brought about their overthrow. When it had assumed political power, this party did not leave a vestige of either landed or capitalist ownership. After making public 
and repudiating the imperialist secret treaties. This party proposed peace to all nations and yielded to the violence of the Brest-Litovsk robbers only after the Anglo-French imperialists had torpedoed the conclusion of a peace and after the Bolsheviks had done everything humanly possible to hasten the revolution in Germany and other countries. The absolute correctness of this compromise entered into by such a party in such a situation is becoming ever clearer and more obvious with every day. The Mensheviks and the socialist revolutionaries in Russia began with treachery by directly or indirectly justifying defense of country, i.e. the defense of their own predatory bourgeoisie. They continued their treachery by entering into a coalition with the bourgeoisie of their own country and fighting, together with their own bourgeoisie, against the revolutionary proletariat of their own country. Their bloc, first with Kerensky and the cadets, and then with Kolchak and Denikin in Russia. Like the bloc of their confreres abroad with the bourgeoisie of their respective countries, was in fact desertion to the side of the bourgeoisie against the proletariat. From beginning to end, their compromise with the bandits of imperialism meant their becoming accomplices in imperialist bandits.